This landscape was once the shoreline of a great inland sea, a place where dinosaurs lived. Today, some 60 million years later, it's the badlands of southern Alberta. In this place, dinosaur bones are found everywhere. What these dinosaurs looked like and how they behaved are questions for both artist and scientist. You know, there's nothing more baffling than to sit and look at a pile of sediments that are 100 million years old and say, these sediments are 100 million years old. They represent the detritus of a world that's completely vanished. How can I see into them? How do they become real? And uh, you have to take this information up, study your fossils, put it together in your mind, and reintegrate it in your imagination. I was doing an Indian mural down in the museum here, and uh, they needed a slide projection show uh, for children, so they sent me up to Dale on dinosaurs. And I thought, everybody knew what a dinosaur looked like? I had no idea. And I says, OK, what do they look like? And he said, your guess is as good as mine. What I've got to do is sculpture this little creature in its bone form. And then, I, then I've got to fit my legs on him. He's in this direction. I've got two sides to work on, so it's quite difficult. See, and eventually I'll get that sculpture in parts, that all those parts go into that egg for the child to put together. Then there's also a book behind that that illustrates the animal, what it would really look like in, in reality. Attitudes, the laying of the eggs. And I'm working here at paleontology because they want it scientifically correct. There are actually only two sites in the world, really, that we have good information on dinosaurs, really, as a dinosaur ecosystem. That's probably Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta and uh, what's called the Nemegt Valley in Mongolia. These two sites represent about a third of the diversity of dinosaurs known in the world. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Claw. It's kind of a strange one. A man manual claw? What did dinosaurs look like? How did they behave? It starts here with field research teams, like this one in China. I think oh, I might also have a Champsosaur too. Champsosaur, yes. Very yeah. thin, narrow blade like the that long. Paleontologists, technicians, geologists, they each bring a special interest to every piece of evidence that's found. Theropods, only one ungulate, that sort of thing. But I haven't found many for the from anything. Shark, we have, yeah. now we've got hybridon, so. Yeah, also at least two different shark types. Teeth, I guess. Yeah. That's kind of neat. Yeah. And the Maybe fauna expands. <laughs> In Western Canada, the grasses of the prairies give way to a glacial cut that forms the badlands of southern Alberta. For thousands of years, meltwater from the retreating ice washed away the soft rock that contained the remains of dinosaurs. These emerging fossils reveal the anatomy of the great creatures that once lived here. Well, this bone is... Um a metatarsal from the flat of the foot, essentially, of an Albertosaurus. And an Albertosaurus with a metatarsal this long is probably an animal that's, um, I would say, 8 to 10 meters long. That's a, it's a very large Albertosaurus and would have weighed in the vicinity of 3 to 4 metric tons. This, for example, is the area which attached to the next metatarsal bone. And the three metatarsals, the main metatarsals of the foot of an Albertosaurus were tightly bound together. Um, forming uh, basically a single structure that didn't move very much. There was some movement here that acted like a spring, because otherwise what you have the potential of doing is breaking your foot, of course, when four tons of, of weight comes down on a foot like this. The edges here are where the ligaments attach that helped hold the whole thing together, and uh, the scarring here, the really bumpy area, may actually indicate some muscle attachment. Finally, if you go down to this region, you can see a deep pit, which is characteristic of carnivorous dinosaurs and a lot of other animals, too. 
And it was here that the ligaments attach from one bone across the joint to the next bone and helped hold the joint together. This is the joint surface itself right here. We, we can be really accurate these days in terms of um, our reconstructions of dinosaurs. Uh, we have a much better understanding now of the musculature and anatomy of the dinosaurs in, in minute detail, thanks to these uh, detailed studies on the bones themselves. There are also some mummified specimens around which show what the skin looks like. And by comparison with modern animals, especially relatives of dinosaurs, both modern birds and, and modern crocodiles, um, we have a pretty good understanding of, of the anatomy of the animals. The only thing that uh, tends to be quite speculative still, of course, is the coloration. And uh, I think artists would uh, very much be upset with us if we started finding colored dinosaurs because they'd have no artistic license left at all in terms of reconstructing these things. Hey guys, I want to you want that there, Patrick? Yeah. 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 There you go. Ride the dinosaur. Say, say, giddy up. There hasn't been a Styracosaurus like this around here for some 80 million years. This one helps give more meaning to the bones of the Badlands. We've, we've always tried to encourage uh, people who have an interest in fossils to, to go and look for fossils in, in Alberta. It's, it's illegal for them to um, excavate dinosaurs, for example, but that doesn't mean they can't go out and collect fossils from the surface or look for them. In the last 10, 15 years, I would say we've discovered maybe a dozen new types of dinosaurs in Alberta. Uh, of that dozen new types of dinosaurs, probably almost half of them were brought to our attention by amateur collectors. All right, it's a completely articulated skeleton of a corythosaur. Again, one of the uh, seven or eight species of hadrosaur, the duck-billed dinosaurs that's found here in the park. Uh, again, the specimen was taken from the sandstone ridge to the right of us and moved down here. It was found in 1964, 65, sorry, by uh, Roy Fowler, who was the first park ranger here at Dinosaur. He noticed the bones eroding out of the ridge. He walked around to the other side of the ridge and saw more bones eroding out of the other side. Uh, realized it was probably a complete skeleton, so they took, used a technique that they don't use too often here anymore. They blasted it out with dynamite. Uh, we don't like using that. Uh, technique anymore because it tends to damage the fossils if you're not careful. How did this one die? How did this one die? Well, likely when it died, it fell into a river or it died uh, near a river and got washed in. And as it got washed down river, it got caught up on the bottom somewhere and uh, probably on a point bar formation, the inner bend of a river, and got sedimented over and, uh, and fossilized. Uh, also, because when they die, the, the tendons in the back of the neck tend to tighten up which pulls the head backwards as well. The majority of fossils that we find in Alberta are pretty common, and they are coming to the surface all the time thanks to erosion. Uh, we know from looking at uh, drilling cores taken from oil wells and gas wells and so on, that these beds extend far underneath the prairies. Um, or similarly, coal mines, big strip mines, will bring to the surface the same age beds that produce the dinosaurs in Dinosaur Park or Drumheller. And so there are literally thousands, if not millions, of dinosaur skeletons yet to be found underneath the grasslands of Alberta. Okay, when you look at your hand, how do your bones in your hand go together? At the Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta, children build a model full scale of the foot of Tyrannosaurus rex. Okay, hey, Andrew. Okay, now we've got our three big toes in front that are all put together, but how many bones do we have left over? In solving the puzzle, they gain some feeling for the time of the dinosaurs. A little bit bigger here so we can see the extra bones that are left over. So we've got three big toes out front, and we've got these extra bones, which are kind of confusing. 
It's a, it's a creature they don't see on Earth today. It's a, a, a imaginary, and yet it's not. When they go to a museum and see these huge bones, it's difficult for their imagination. Because sometimes these little children come in with the parents, oh, daddy, I'm not scared. I'm not scared. And he's hanging on to daddy like mad. And uh, daddy says, I know, dear. <laughs> But they're big, and they're, they're unimaginable to them. They're accustomed to a, a dog, a cat, a cow, a horse, a pig, and the things they see in the zoos, you know. What we see in the museums makes us wonder about a world so different from the one we know. That sense of wonder, that search for a link between ourselves and times past, drives the artist's imagination. Under an animation camera, a filmmaker creates images of dinosaurs from grains of sand. There are as many visions of the past as there are people who create them. A bunch of filmmakers sat down with the rough cut of the uh, documentary footage and thought about ideas that we could uh, illuminate the footage with. And uh, one of the sequences involved a, a bone bed of uh, hundreds of centrosaurs of all ages that had died. And they didn't exactly know what had caused the death, but they assumed it was a mass drowning or a flood, something like that. The set itself is purely imagination. We arrived at what we thought was a nice compromise, scientifically, simply by making it a very strange, foggy, swampy image. I could get away with a lot. It was more of a mood piece than a scientifically accurate piece. Winter, Drumheller, Alberta. A team skilled in the craft of museum exhibits is reconstructing dinosaurs. A frame is being built to support the plastic replicas of fossils found in China. Replicas, of course, because the real bones would be far too heavy. I don't know. It's just sort of have any uh, spine on it at all. I don't think we're going to put one on because this is where our cables have our cable come through here. Most of us have been groupies, um, museum groupies. We have uh, worked at the museum at one time and learned our skills there, so we brought our skills to this project. Uh, so it's basically, uh, if you work well with your hands, then you can uh, catch on to what we do here. I mean, certainly right now it already looks as if it's brought its tail up too far. Uh, in terms They're of assembling the skeleton of Mementosaurus, all 75 feet of it. It was the largest of the China finds. Um, still, until we get the end of the tail on, we're not going to know how good it looks. And we're going to have to drop it down a bit more. Right now, it seems to be almost kinked right here. Yeah. Oh, you have to ask Phil the right questions, because uh, like he'll, he'll look and won't necessarily comment on it. Uh, but if you ask him, you know, does this look right? And he say yes or no. And sometimes he'll say no. And if you say, well, what do we have to do to change it? And he will tell you. So it's a bit like pulling tea sometimes with Phil, but uh, uh, he knows what he wants. And uh, uh, he has infinite patience if he, yeah. Yeah, it looks like that. Well, I, I think one or two of your ribs should be like that, uh, yeah. fairly large and flat, especially the ones under the scapula. But as soon as you get back a little further, those are definitely way too fat. Yeah. It's a lot of work grinding them down, though, and making them look decent. Well, that's why we have a belt sender. It works <laughs> quite well. <laughs> yeah. A fully assembled skeleton is as close to a real dinosaur as one gets. A painting, on the other hand, puts flesh on the bones, can depict great strength, and place the animal in its own environment. 
animation adds the illusion of life and drama. The first, not very accurate, drawings of dinosaurs were by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins in the mid-1800s. Growing interest in dinosaurs prompted a meeting in 1853 of the world's first paleontologists, held in a life-size but unfinished model of an iguanodon. It was the British scientist Richard Owen who, in 1841, coined the term dinosauria from the Latin for terrible lizards. Early attempts at reconstruction used the actual fossil bones, which being in effect solid rock, required some serious engineering. We have a tremendous number of articulated skeletons, that is, complete skeletons of dinosaurs that are really good display quality specimens. However, it's not surprising that when people started collecting the, um, the garbage bones and the isolated teeth and, and bones that had been left before, that we suddenly found that dinosaurs weren't the major animal there, that in fact they were greatly outnumbered by uh, frogs and salamanders and fish and even mammals. Uh, there were more mammals in Dinosaur Park than there were dinosaurs. But we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't collected the smaller specimens too. These sort of radiating bones right there. Mm -hmm. Unless they're just radiating scales. Oh, I scales. You look just at these turned things. on edge there? Yeah, they just turned on edge and split. Oh. Okay. These are really, look, look at them, they're really long. And square and they overlap with. Yeah, I, I agree, I think it's a lizard. Looks like an armored lizard. This part of the Gobi Desert was once a large swampy lake. The rock formed from its sediments holds clues to life as it was 80 million years ago. The story is revealed just a little at a time. In the world today, there's less than 30 people who work on dinosaurs. The whole science is, has progressed so slowly that we only know of about 300 or so species of dinosaurs. Now, that may sound like a lot initially, but you have to remember that that 300 species is spread out over 150 million years and the entire world. Today, we have over 8,000 species of birds alive in the world. We have over 6,000 species of reptiles and amphibians. And we have over 4,000 species of mammals. And you get the idea that the diversity of dinosaurs that we know right now is just a very small part of what their world must have been like. What we have here is uh, the fibula off a duck-billed dinosaur. And what's interesting about this one in this bone bed is that uh, it has a fracture through it, right here, which uh, happened when the animal was alive and fused up again. Uh, it's not uncommon for dinosaurs to, to have bone deformities or bone crushing. We find a lot of uh, uh, vertebrae where the arches have uh, either been crushed from downward pressure on the tail or on the animal's back from something hitting it from above, and they flare and uh, form nice uh, bony processes like this. Uh, through walking on this broken leg has caused uh, the bone to, to shift and then one end slowly fused in by building up a calcium bridge across. It was probably a healthy individual at the time that the break occurred, uh, so it probably went into a hiding or something. Uh, at the time, you didn't just have this big flat here, you had uh, probably a, a lake, and then you had uh, a forest or something, probably a couple of miles off, which you could obviously hide in. Uh, it just makes you wonder, like, uh, these animals aren't as supreme as they may seem, 
even though they're 28 feet long, they still suffer from all the ailments that you or I could suffer from. They still get the parasites, the disease, the broken bones from their environment. And it just makes them seem more human. The animator's vision of a moment long past is based upon the work of other artists, like Donna Sloan, a dinosaur enthusiast. It's right on that little tongue of bone right there. She specializes in technically accurate drawings. I'm debating whether to do that, that drawing over because it, it's saying it's not right. It's just That's one of the harder to... things to show. When you have such a three dimensional specimen as this, uh, you need many drawings to try and give the feeling of, of what it's really doing. With a lot of these things, a drawing works better because you can you can play down the cracks and the, the breaks and the missing parts. You, you know, you can eliminate uh, depth of field problems that you get with the photography. And the illustrations help the scientists who are reading these papers that to understand what it is has been found. It's important to know the anatomy and the taxonomy of the animals. And it's interesting to think of what they actually were like. The thing is to get the animals the way they really were, like the, the, the life that's in them. I see a lot of uh, drawings of animals that they seem very uh, static. They're just standing there in profile, and it says that it's this long, and it weighed this much, and it ate plants. And, and to me, they're real animals, because I've worked with these bones, and you just you can feel just the life force from the, what they've, they've got a crayfish. We find these sometimes in concretions from the bear paw formation, you know, the marine. And uh, he's, he's caught one. The other one obviously wants it. It's, it's kind of like the seagulls on the, the beach with the peanut butter sandwich kind of a story. And uh, as a sketch, I might turn this into a good drawing later on as soon as I sort out some of the background problems. But what I thought would be neat is, I've seen cows do this, they will actually come right up and very delicately with the ends of their hooves scratch the tip of their nose. And I thought, if something like a cow can do that so delicately, why not a hadrosaur? Actually, they're not, they're not all that heavy and, and ungainly an animal. If you, if you see them, they're, you know, compared to some of the, the big sauropods and things, they're very delicately made creatures, so I want them to have a real animal essence. And to do that, you have to have them doing animal things. The behavior of dinosaurs must have been influenced by their environment. And so there's another task, filling in the details of a dinosaur ecology. Okay, we're going to have a look at a pollen grain here. It's a very large grain. You can see these uh, little circular white spots here. These are actually holes into the wall of the pollen grain from where the pollen tube will germinate through one of these or through a couple of them. The, the amount of pollen produced by plants, as you know, is very, very great. I mean, hay fever sufferers can attest to this fact. I mean, it's always in the atmosphere. It's called the pollen rain, in fact. And um, it, it, because most of it does not reach its destination, which is the female flower, of course, most of it settles right down into the earth. And on that pollen that settles into ponds, lakes, rivers, and streams will eventually fall and settle to the bottom of those ponds, be covered by more sediment, more silt, and eventually become part of the rock that's formed and therefore fossilized. So all I need to collect is a small amount of rock, say a, a piece roughly this size. So, you know, something the size of your fist would be almost too much. Processing even less than this, I could probably extract from good type sediment, a good shale or siltstone, I could probably extract over a million pollen grains, individual pollen grains, probably representing three or 400 different kinds of plants. 
So from one small rock sample, I can get information on three or 400 different types of plants that may have been growing at the time those rocks were laid down. Now the environments during the times the dinosaurs were varied, just as they are today. You'll have sort of uh, open savanna type areas, then you'll have upland forests, you might even have some subtropical vegetation types creeping in. And through an examination of that pollen, we were able to determine that the environment must have been a low backwater or oxbow lake type of environment with these various trees and plants. This one in particular happens to be a magnolia tree, and then some water plants that were in the area at that time. They're so excited with their scientific things, and the, they want me to make a beautiful painting of it. And uh, I've got to control them that I have to know what they want in it first, because it can destroy the whole composition. Because in the middle of a painting, or at almost a finish, they come in with some beautiful plant they thought existed at that time, and they want me to put that in there. And it's like music. You're putting a tone in there in the middle of your song and it just doesn't fit. Um, when Ellie started to paint this, uh, this picture, I was uh, under the impression that I had recovered some pollen from Dinosaur Provincial Park, which was related to a plant known as Metrosideros. There's, there's no real common name that I know of anyway. And this Metrosideros tree is rather unique in the fact that it's a member of the, um, of the Myrtaceae, which grows only in the Southern Hemisphere today. And to find it in Canada was not as bizarre as it may seem, because we found other plants that only occur today in the southern hemisphere, so it didn't throw me off too much. But the pollen that I recovered was few in number, and my identifications were tentative, but I thought, let's go with it anyway, and so we did. And Ellie painted a very, very beautiful Metrosideros tree here. While she was painting this, and it took her several months to complete this painting, I had found new information by, by using my microscope and, and, and scanning more and more slides. I found new information that gave me the feeling that this, in fact, was not Metrosideros, that I had misidentified the pollen, or at least it was uncertain. And so my confidence level had dropped very, very drastically. And so first went to Dale and mentioned the fact to him that uh, we should probably remove Metrosideros from the painting. He was reluctant at first because Metrosideros is a beautiful tree and some unbelievable, beautiful red flowers that have these very fine uh, stamens that are very showy. I think a lot prettier than Magnolia, in fact. So Dale and I together um, spoke with Ellie. Now, Ellie was used to having things changed, uh, especially by Dr. Russell. He would come in and say, no, the muscle's not right. No, the leg's in the wrong position. No, and she'd be just frantically changing things back and forth. Uh, she is a very patient lady, as you may or may not know, but she is extremely patient. She just looked at us probably with some disgust, but she eventually said, if it has to be changed for, for scientific accuracy, then she would, of course, change it. And then I remember some, some grumbles under her breath or something, perhaps. But uh, she eventually changed, as I say, every, every individual leaf, every individual flower in that, on that tree. Ellie works with images. Uh, she sees colors and, and forms, shapes and dimensions and um, arrangements. And she sees these excite her in the same way that words and uh, and sometimes mathematical relationships excite me. So in this sense then, we work so well together because we each speak each other's language just enough so that we can really communicate and we both uh, respect the working of the, of the two team. It, it's fun with them though, I enjoy that. I enjoy working with them very much. And uh, Dale gets so excited uh, working on these things. When I'm painting it, he, he just, <sighs> And oh, Ellie, that's it, that's it. And he, we tell stories, like he tells me stories that he, how he thinks they are, how he thinks they eat, how he thinks they run, and uh, like he feels they're big eating machines, you know, and, and the whole thing is to eat. As a consequence of making models of these skeletons first and then putting the muscles directly onto these skeletal three-dimensional models that we had, that I found, to my delight, that uh, the character of the animal emerged when you made a skeleton first upon which to put the three-dimensional muscles. And then from this point on, it's a buildup of that muscle to get that to look proper. I build it up until I get my muscles where I want it, like in here, then where my hollows are, and I give this the power that it needs to pull this leg around, and then I begin my finishing. 
See, I want his skin to give the appearance like an elephant. And I don't want to lose the shape, but I've got to get my little wrinkles in there. I sculpture it for the scientists' feelings, because we, no one knows what they look like. And uh, once I get my bone structures, then with the scientists, we create the muscles around that bone structure. And at least I know I'm accurate with bones when I'm guessing at uh, how fat a muscle should be or how he'd move or what would happen. And uh, at least when, when I'm finished with that sculpture, then I've got a model to paint from. Otherwise, it's imaginary, and I can't imagine a muscle twisting or something happening there or what it would look like. And I've got my model to work with. Whenever I've had the good fortune to travel to interesting places, I've always taken photographs of scenes that say something to me that I can communicate to her. So we work with uh, 35 mil slides and plasticine clay. That's our language. Ellie's finished painting is based on the best we now know about a world long since vanished. You're not going out to find the laws of nature and, and being able to define those. I mean, essentially, once you've discovered one level of information, you open up uh, many new doors and you end up um, having more questions very often than you had when you originally started on a particular line of thought. So science is a process and, and uh, to get from one point to another you, you certainly, it's like having a map, you like to have, you know where you want to go and you know how you want to get there through the map, but you can vary the routes. It's, it's almost like being a detective. Um, you're looking for clues and you're trying to solve a mystery. Um, the clues sometimes are very obscure, uh, but if you don't look for them, then you don't know which way you're going to end up going. The adventure in a dinosaur hunt is to come across the unexpected. Every now and then, there's a find different from all the others. In 1989, the team in the Gobi Desert discovered the remains of baby dinosaurs who appear to have been buried alive. What sort of inclination do you need on a, you know, slip face or whatever? 30, 30, 30 to 35 degrees. The possibility of a small landslide came under discussion. Well, I, would, I would expect contorted bedding from a slump. Well, let them finish the job and then we'll look closely at the rock because I, I, I haven't had the opportunity to look at this, okay? Yeah, okay. Look around, but I haven't seen this. Fair enough. And then Fair maybe enough. we'll find something, okay? Fair enough. To, to confirm this interpretation, okay? Okay. Maybe the position of animals would tell us something. Yeah, I'm skeptical yeah. myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, make, I, I told you, we can make an experiment with Kevin, you know, like with this big old <laughs> Indian <laughs> Kevin, and then <laughs> we'll see <laughs> what kind of position he will have. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Dying. Dying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. This is Canada Day, so it's got to be nice to be today. nice to Kevin Because I'm being nice to everybody else. <laughs> I don't have a problem with, with the pronunciation of your name, Kevin, because I have a neighbor, and her son was Kevin, and every day I was listening, Kevin, Kevin, <laughs> go home. <laughs> okay, I get the message. The baby animals belong to a group known as armored dinosaurs. Fully grown, they'd have been the size of a tank. The 
this is a uh, field preparation, which we sometimes do, sometimes don't. Uh, more likely, we don't. Uh, just to see what we have in the ground. Uh, this will later be sent to the museum, either in Beijing or across to Canada, and have a final prep done on it where all the sand will be removed from all the little denticles. You can see there's still some sand inside here. You've got little red dots. That can all be removed using a, a microscope and a pin vise, which is what we usually use. Right now I'm using just a dental probe, which isn't, isn't fine enough for this type of thing. Hmm. Well, they could either be burrows or they could be roots that have grown through the skull at some later time after it was buried. Oops. I think they're probably burrows, though. Uh, you can see they've got a lot of little bone chips in them. Paul uh, Johnson studies the ancient traces left behind by insects. Uh, one of the interesting things about this, though, is that if they are burrows uh, produced by, say, insects, for example, and if these baby ankylosaurs were buried in a small-scale catastrophe, maybe a sandstorm or a dune slump, it shows that they weren't so deeply buried that uh, scavenging organisms such as insects or maggots or whatever couldn't, couldn't attack, attack the them. body after they died. Mm -hmm. So these guys were actually eating the baby ankylosaurs? Uh, they were after it died uh, under the sand when it was rotting. It would probably be burrowing through it, uh, taking out whatever nutrients it could, and as it would go through the bone, it would uh, uh, defecate little bone chips. Yeah, that's likely. basically it, yeah. This is one of the feet that was found this year from a, a small theropod called Sornithoides. Sornithoides is uh, one of the very first dinosaurs, in fact, found in uh, Outer Mongolia, or the People's Republic of Mongolia. And this dinosaur is also well known from Alberta under a different name called Troodon. Now, this particular specimen is not a mature one. Uh, this is the femur, for example, or the upper leg bone. And you can see it's actually quite short, considering it's a man-sized animal normally. We're looking at a, a baby, therefore, uh, maybe a quarter grown. If you look at the claws, for example, the claws are very sharp and uh, quite gracile. They're very much like a, a, the claws of a raptorial bird. That's a normal claw, but in addition to that, he has a, a side claw, which if you put it on the foot, is raised above the ground and is very sharply recurved and, and is obviously a claw that's used for ripping and tearing his prey. So that's one clue. A second clue is if you look at the proportions of the leg, uh, we'll take this for example, these are the metatarsals here, uh, the bones that are in the flat of your foot. Now, Soren authorities, like all other carnivorous dinosaurs, walked on his toes. And if you look at the length of the metatarsus, or these particular bones through the flat of the foot, they're in fact quite a bit longer than the femur. And the other bone in the lower part of the leg, uh, the tibia, is also quite a bit longer than the femur. So you're looking at a leg that's uh, more than three times the length of the highest limb bone, or the thigh bone. And what that indicates is that this is a very rapidly running animal. It's an animal that could attain very high speeds. Uh, we, we know this because we've made comparisons with modern animals. And we, the faster the animal is, the longer the lengths of these lower parts of the limb are. We know from studies of the brain case of this particular dinosaur that uh, this group of dinosaurs was probably the the so-called brainiest of all the dinosaurs that we know of. Uh, in relative size, the brain is much bigger in this animal than it is in any other dinosaur we know about right now. We know that this particular group of dinosaurs had, in fact, uh, turned the thumb around so the thumb was facing the next two main fingers. There is a connection between the opposable thumb and, and the intelligence itself. Uh, I think a better connection, though, is, is the fact that he had the opposability in the, in the hand to look at things and uh, what you would expect at that point is not eyes on the side of the head, but eyes that have shifted forward. And this has also happened in this particular group of dinosaurs that they had stereoscopic vision, just like humans and, and modern birds do. Eighty million years ago, the Troodon lived in what is now southern Alberta.
Small by dinosaur standards, their world was populated by many animals much larger than themselves. But the Troodon had the advantage of intelligence and speed. They probably hunted in pairs or groups, feeding on small mammals and amphibians. In this particular sequence, we're seeing the world from the point of view of a little troodon, which is a very smart little dinosaurs that lived in uh, Cretaceous time. He's met uh, a pal, and they're frog hunting. And at this point, uh, the troodon hears the kaplunk of the frog, and and then they're they're off to uh, to to hunt frogs. And making a plunge to grab the little, the little frog, which, because of my squeamishness, I actually had the, the frog get away. But in fact, a frog would be, um, you know, appropriate, uh, appropriate dinner. Their footprints have been found around the egg-laying sites of other dinosaurs. This suggests they were also robbers of nests. The two Truodon have come up and they're hiding behind two trees and they're looking at one another, trying to planning an attack on the eggs which are in the foreground on another level. The mother's heard the two Truodons attacking her nest and she's reacting to that noise. She's turning around and screaming. So this is just a very quick scene. It entails maybe five drawings and see. And with that, you can stop frame it. Like here, I can just stop. Okay, you know, this. Is, it doesn't work, it's too big or it's too small or the eye's looking the wrong way and on film it's going to wobble. So. It was not only the bones of dinosaurs that were chiseled out of the Gobi Desert. What was also uncovered were their fossilized eggs. It's a curious fact that uh, all of the eggs that have been found in Central Asia now have never yet yielded more than one specimen which has uh, tiny bones inside of them. And this is very peculiar because it uh, suggests that something was destroying the babies inside without destroying the eggs necessarily. We can confirm that too because if we take uh, a piece of this eggshell and we look at the inside of the eggshell we can actually see resorption pits or places where the embryos were large enough that they were starting to absorb the calcium from the eggshell itself which suggests that the baby dinosaurs were maturing inside the eggs and yet they're not found as baby dinosaurs so something's going on and there's been a number of ideas suggested including uh, one fairly recent one by Kevin which I think is a good one and, and that is that the um, the contents of the egg itself may have been chemically active enough to dissolve the bone of the embryos. The history of dinosaurs and the, the amount of uh, years that they lived and existed just amazes me. I don't remember it technically, they do, but uh, how did they grow so big? Like, this amazes me. Was the uh, uh, Earth uh, less uh, with the gravity that, that, you know, they just kept going or, you know? And, and what was the great extinction, you know? How massive was it? It had to be around the entire Earth in the Cretaceous era. It affected the entire surface of the Earth. Some, some think uh, they ate themselves to death, that they were so big they just kept eating and there wasn't enough food left, you know? It's fascinating. There are a lot of problems related to dinosaurs and why they were so successful and why they died out that uh, really constitute puzzles, both large-scale puzzles that uh, probably in my lifetime will never be answered and small-scale puzzles that I can answer by going out into the field and looking at the dinosaur resources. 
So I'm always developing these uh, little mysteries that have to be solved is, is, uh, to run my life, essentially, in dinosaur research. And uh, so for the next couple of years, I'll be looking at a particular problem. And in that time period, I should be able to solve it. But beyond that, I know it's contributing towards solving some of the bigger mysteries of dinosaurs, like why they died out. Perhaps no other science requires such a wide range of ideas and skills. We know now there's hardly any place on Earth where dinosaur bones are not to be found. But to piece together the world and its creatures of a hundred million years ago both baffles and demands imagination. It's nice, it's playtime. It's not a job, it's fun. <laughs>